enjoy my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you, and no. Which brings me to this Sunday and the rather troubling passage that will be the focus of our, our worship this morning, Jesus' cleansing of the temple according to the Gospel of John, which we will discover really means that Jesus doesn't like religion. 
and we'll find out what that means. We're here today to not be religious. We're here today to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, please rise as we begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christ has so generously blessed us with his grace, mercy, and peace. Guess what we, did, we get to do? Not keep it to ourselves, but to share it with everyone else. And let's do that now as we greet one another with the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you always. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Hudson is from the first Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 through 25. Paul writes, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. John writes, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. And he also poured out the coins of money, of the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, we've got a nice little group here this morning. All right. I've got, I want to ask you about first. Have any of you ever worked in like, outside like in a garden? Planted something? Get down there with your hands? What happens to your hands when you plant something in the dirt and you cover it up? They get dirty. Get dirty hands. When you come into your come into the house, does your mom like that you got dirty hands? Yeah. Oh, well, how are you gonna how are you gonna get rid of those dirty hands? You got a knee like this. What's this? A bar of soap. What does it say? Dial. Dial soap. Standard good hand soap to get those hands clean. Okay. It's been a few days since you've had a bath or a shower. Now, not only may your fits be smelling a little bit, but what, what, what I bet your hair is like, your hair gets dirty? My hair gets dirty. It gets really bad when it gets dirty. It gets all greasy and ugly and yucky. I got to get it clean. But, you know, I don't use this. What do you use to get your hair clean? What kind of special kind of soap? What is that? 
Shampoo, that's a great way to get your hair clean. Okay, do any of you like cooking? Done cooking? No, so a little bit. You do, okay. What do you like to cook? Cookies. Cookies. All right, have you ever heated up anything up on a stove, like in a pan? And sometimes, now this one's been clean, but sometimes they really get dirty, right? Greasy stuff gets burned on. You kind of rub it there with your spatula or whatever, what knife or spoon, and it doesn't come off. How are you going to get it clean? Your dirty pan. Aha! I have a solution. Guess what? What is that? That's not a sponge. Touch it. What is it? What do you say? What did you say? Somebody said it. I know. It's, a, it's like a Brillo pad, like an SOS pad. It's a steel pad with soap in it. So I can rub it around in my hand and get it clean. All these different ways to get clean. Okay. I'm going to tell you about another thing this morning that we need to get clean. And that's that we need to get clean hearts. You ever hear that before? Clean heart? Your heart, you kind of think, what is, to get a clean heart, does that mean I got to go to surgery and you got to cut open my heart and clean it out? No. Because when we talk about a heart, we're not just talking about the organ in our chest. We're talking about, well, it's kind of like who we are as a person. And sometimes when our heart is not clean, this is what happens. Or it happens because, you know, we haven't done what we're supposed to do. We feel guilty. Or we feel ashamed. Or we want to run and hide when our parents show up. Or we, our heart is dirty when we feel sad. When we have maybe failed the test. When we feel like our friends don't like us anymore. How do we get rid of a clean heart? Yes? Well, how do I get to feel happy? If I got all these really bad feelings, are you just telling me I got to work hard and feel happy? No. Guess what? That's why you guys are here this morning. We have a special gift for you to clean your hearts. And you're all going to have a way to participate in it. Now, you come to church every Sunday. When we come to church at King of Glory, we always gather around that. What is that? What do we call it? That big table. The altar. We always gather. And what do we get from the altar? We get communion, right? If, who of you uh, are already receiving communion? Okay, you girls are over here, and you feel like, couple, no, you're, oh, you are not real, not yet, yet. Come here, Hannah, come up here. Come here. Come and stand right here, Hannah. Come here. What did we do yesterday when you and I met? We had class, didn't we? We sat and talked about your coming first communion. So you don't take communion. Some of you don't take communion yet, but all of you, can come forward to receive the only thing that can make your hearts clean. And that's Jesus' love. So let's do that right now. I want all of you to come up here and kneel down at the communion rail. And when all of you do, whether you all get Jesus' good word like this, and I want you to listen very carefully, because this is the way you get a clean heart, I will say to you, Jesus says, you are mine. 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 Jesus says, you are mine, Jesus says. 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 
you are mine. Jesus says, you are mine. Trust that promise and your hearts are clean. Boys and girls, just stay where you're at, fold your hands, bow your heads, and let's pr talk to God this morning in our usual echo prayer. Good morning, God. Thank you for cleaning our hearts with your love, with your good word, with your promise. Help us always to believe it, to trust it, to make it our own, and cling to it every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, most people even though we are in an increasingly secular society, are not hostile to religion. Even those who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious believe, you know, that if people would only, only follow the Ten Commandments, you know, most of this world's problems would disappear. But according to today's Gospel, that is exactly the kind of religion that Jesus came to end. If Jesus came to visit us today, as he did then, it would probably be something like this. Just as we're ready to start the service. A visitor stands up. It starts to cause a commotion, all kinds of yelling. Some folks, some of the guys, try to come and restrain him, calm him down. As he starts walking around the sanctuary, angrily shouting, starting to throw hymnals at us, pushing everybody else aside, and he rushes to the altar, and he throws everything on the floor, and we are shocked. Done. How could he dare to do this? That is Jesus in today's gospel. Rarely do we ever think of Jesus as being this angry. The gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke report this happening at the end of Jesus' ministry during the last week of his life after his critics had poked at him for years. Yeah, Jesus' rage was understandable after all of that. His patience has reached its limit. But in the Gospel of John, this event happens at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. There's no way to explain Jesus' rage. So far in John, no one has even raised a word against Jesus. Everyone has been impressed, even marveling. For example, back there at Cana when Jesus turned water into wine. But now he stands there in the temple, burning with white hot fury, whip in hand, kicking over the tables, squawking birds set loose, and slinging coins everywhere. Get these things out of here, he screams. Stop making my father's house into a marketplace. The problem is not only that Jesus is mad. The problem is that he is in the temple mad. The scene occurs in the temple during Passover, the greatest religious celebration of the year for Jews. This is like Christmas Eve, a king of glory, 
and the candles are burning romantically in the darkness as the congregation sings Silent Night. And Jesus bursts in, angry, whip in hand, kicking over the Christmas tree and yelling, Bah humbug! That day in the temple, indeed, Jesus did not complain about all those sins you commit, like adultery or stealing or covetousness and, you know, things that you'd expect him to complain about. Instead, <laughs> he assaults the Christmas tree, tears apart our worship service, ruins silent night. He attacks our Religion. Oh, we would be okay with attacks, you know, on those bad Pharisees and their legalism and those horrible scribes for their snobbishness and the crooks for their thefts and the criminals for their violence and the rich for their greed. But here he barges in and attacks us. And here we are. I don't get it. We got out of bed this morning to come to church. Inconvenienced our daily schedule. And he attacks us. Oh, Jesus, did you notice? We make pledges to, for, to support our church with money. <laughs> and Jesus is upset with us. It's like he doesn't want it. You don't want to put all those who are still sleeping in. You know who they are. They never darken the door of the church, let alone open our wallets to help anyone. Instead of attacking them, he attacks people like us who are trying to show up and take our religion seriously. You know, Jesus, those merchants in the temple, they were providing a much needed service for those who were taking their religion seriously. Roman coins, the only kind used in Jerusalem, could not be used to pay the temple tax. One needed shekels. Therefore, every time you went to your synagogue, the temple, the church, if you wanted to give an offering, you had to deal with the money changers. I mean, if you wanted to offer God an unspotted ox, unblemished lamb, a beautiful pigeon, as scripture requires, then you got to buy one from a temple merchant. You know, just like we write a check arrange for an electronic transfer today. I mean, Jesus, what's wrong with that? The tables that Jesus overturns are ours. The religion he wants to end is ours. Jesus' holy outrage reminds us that we cannot reduce our relationship to God, the God of the universe, to the level of a business transaction. And yet we do. Oh, you know, here, put your money in the offering plate, make a charitable contribution, write a check, and you will get a pleasant dose of God. Our society has problems. We convince ourselves that the solution is simple. Just be more religious. Just follow the Ten Commandments. They make sense. It pays to do what is right. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. And if we do these things, yes, God will reward us with happiness. Clean hearts.
You know, even the pastor falls into this trap. <laughs> I too like religion. I want people to come to me with their problems so I can feel important and needed. And then someone says, Pastor, I've got this problem in my life. I've got to make this difficult decision. Do you think I've done the right thing? Have I made the right decision? Oh, and it's so tempting for me to respond. Oh, sure. You've probably done that right. After all, you're a good person. And I've made them feel happy. Given them their daily dose of God. So often when we come to church, there is no sense of being on sacred ground. There is no sense of being in the temple with Jesus where there is smoke and screams of slaughtered animals on the altar and blood, blood trickling down the marble steps. No sense of being in the presence of a holy God. It is only a polite business transaction. Thank you, sir. You put your worries in here and your cares in here and we will send you out with a blessing there. Very neat. We sometimes make the church into the neighborhood supermarket. Get out of bed, get dressed, open the hymnal, sing the songs, keep your eyes open, drop your money in the offering plate, stand for the benediction, and say hello to God. And then we get to go back home having done our duty, having gotten church out of the way by having performed our religious obligation. And this made Jesus very mad. Very, very mad. Very, very, very mad. I think John chose to tell this troubling story right up there at the front in the beginning of the gospel because he wanted us to know right up there from the beginning of the gospel of John what kind of God we meet in Jesus. If any of us thought that our salvation was coming in the form of a nice young man from the Middle East who will turn water into wine in our weddings invite a few of us to join his prayer group and say nice things to us, we are terribly mistaken. John shows us a Jesus pounding at the door, waving a whip, overturning the tables, driving the unleashed oxen across the new carpet and spoiling the service. Our polite religion makes him so mad. I bet that Jesus would rather be an atheist than to practice a religion like that. That brings you back to the Ten Commandments. As we discussed in this morning's adult class, Ten Commandments are not just rules so that we can get what we want. On the contrary, they are the mirror. The mirror that reveals us for the sinners that we are. That we have, as we heard this morning, Yabat's disease. The commandments are the prosecutors accusing us of using our religion to cover up the fact that we have not trusted God as we ought, nor loved our neighbor as we should. In this season of Lent, we do not merely fret over our mistakes. We stand before a righteous and holy God whose commandments intrude on our lives, 
overturn the tables, set wild birds loose and dump coins on the floor. His presence is the sting of a whip on our back as he barges into our Sunday morning worship service and drives us out of our complacency. <laughs> when those in the temple who, who were deeply offended, believe me, just like we would be, ask Jesus, what gives you the right to vent your anger like this? And Jesus had an utterly strange reply. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Oh, and the crowd are saying, three days? Jesus, come on, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple. It took us years of careful planning and major financial commitments and taking out a mortgage and paying it back to build this church, we say. it all down in three days raise it you know and we like they in the temple that day dragged him from the temple and we stripped him and we beat him and we hung him on a cross to die Jesus that is what we think of you after what you did to our religion but Three days later, when he burst forward from his tomb and kicked down the doors of death, we remembered what he said to us that day in the temple, that Sunday in church. And when we asked him for a sign of true religion, we explained him to point to our goodness. And instead he pointed to his cross, to his death and resurrection. There is the true temple. There we get the goodness of God. There we get our clean hearts. Built not on our works, our accomplishments, our deeds, whatever you want to call them, but on his body and blood. And now we understand what that ruckus was all about in the temple. Now we know why he was so against our religion. Now we know where to meet God, the God we can trust. Not in our religion of good deeds, warm feelings, self-serving attempts to be good, all of our successes and happiness. No. We meet this God in Jesus where? At the end of our rope. At the back of the bus. At the end of the line. When our lives have fallen apart. When we are ashamed and want to hide and run. There we meet the God. Jesus, who washes us in his blood and drenches us in his forgiveness and bathes us at the baptismal font and protects us in the shadow of his cross. And there, the angry voice of Jesus that cleanses the temple is silenced. There, God's scathing judgment of us has ended. There is the end of religion. And instead, we get to hear the promise of a new life. We get to feel those hands on our head. Jesus says, you are mine. And there is a new beginning. For now, we are alive in Christ. Our life changes the religion that demands that we have to keep score and have to keep track of how well we have lived 
and that continually exhausts us with its relentless requirements and unending expectations is over, kaput, done, finished. Jesus has ended that way of living. Christ has brought us to an end to that, that kind of religion. We now are free and get to use our lives to serve, a world, to serve the world instead of always having to check on how well we are doing. God, I hope you're watching. No. We joyfully go into our homes, our neighborhoods, our schools, our places of work, not to be religious and to show off how pious we are, but to freely give ourselves a way to serve our neighbor. And we never expected to give glory to our God. And for that privilege, for that opportunity, what can we say but thanks be to God for ending our religion Please rise for the end.
Let us join all those Christians of every time and place who have been set apart, who have been made holy by the cross of Christ in confessing our faith in that God whom we meet in Jesus in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, God and not me, one being with the Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all, all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. O oh God, you are our hope and delight, and our religion, and our foolish attempts to think that somehow we can earn our way into your favor. Wash us in your mercy. Clean our hearts. Feed us at your table. Protect us in the shadow of your cross so that we may take hold of our new life in Christ. You alone are God. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest. Awaken the church to the mystery of your presence and your amazing grace, and give us glad hearts as we receive the good news of your deliverance. You renew creation, protect rainforests, mountaintops, oceans, and wilderness areas from abuse, pollution, and exploitation. Unite nations, policymakers, and businesses in efforts to care for our environment. You judge the nations, we pray for an end to war and strife in every land. Especially today, we remember our brothers and sisters, Jewish and Palestinian in Gaza, and our brothers, Russians and Ukrainians in Ukraine. Bring healing and peace. Strengthen international efforts to negotiate peace and provide humanitarian aid to people fleeing the conflict. You bring healing and hope. We give thanks for physicians, nurses, researchers, therapists, and public health workers who prevent and treat illness. We pray for any who are sick, especially today. We remember Lee and Wes, Craig, Kay, Carol, Vicki, John, Ann, Pete, George, Carol, Linda, Jeannie, Joyce, Randall, Mary, Bob, and all those whom we name before you now in our hearts. You abide with your people. Strengthen any in this community undergoing life transitions. 
marriage, divorce, childbirth, adoption, moving, graduation, employment change, or loss of a loved one. Accompany us in our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We have been blessed by God's mercy so abundantly and so uh, immensely. So much so that we share our time, talent, and treasure with God's work through the mission of this congregation. We thank you for your offerings. with you lift up your hearts let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ in this time of Lent you call your people to cleanse our hearts and to prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that, renewed in the gift of our baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so we remember, on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us join together in praying that prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven. All has been prepared. Come, eat, and live. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> keep you strong in your faith today, tomorrow, and always. Depart in peace. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can.
can see.